Right. Our fourth and last panel for today. Um, this is the secularism as a defense of women's and minority rights one. Chairing and introducing this panel is a woman we've seen many times on TV. Uh, she's a writer, journalist, broadcaster, and an influential feminist. She was active in the women's liberation movement, a founder of the Red Rag, Marxist and feminist journal, and many others. She's received numerous awards, including the Cheltenham Festival Literary Prize, the Fawcett Prize, and several honorary doctorates for her work on community, crime, and children's welfare. Please welcome Beatrix Campbell and the panel. Hello. Well, the first thing to say is it's astounding that you're all still here. <laughs> and I think that, and we all know why, because we've been shivered to our timbers, fascinated by everything that we've heard today. And, and I will say again to Mariam and the organisers of this event, thank you so much, because all of us, I think, have just felt horrified, warmed, and enlightened by the intelligence of everybody who's spoken so far and the sheer courage of everybody who's spoken so far. And we're going to have the same experience again because we have a panel of women of great courage. Um, I want to say a word to you first before we all begin to talk. I want to say a word about me. I'm from England. Nobody's perfect. Do you know? <laughs> and there's a characteristic of the English, which is that we are little Englanders. And we get, you see me decline, we get littler and littler by the minute. The reason I'm telling you this is because, well, two reasons. One is that in conversations about this kind of stuff that we're talking about today, we who are from England, are often the people who are going on about people who are from somewhere else, who have the misfortune of being defined by faiths, religions, practices that are often deemed kind of medieval, except that we're all, everybody's been talking today about how very, very modern these practices are, as if we weren't, we who are from very, very, getting littler by the second, England, had nothing to say about any of this. But, which is my favourite word in the English language, but, think about it. Our government, at the moment, survives, depends upon, talks more to, than it talks to any of you, a party, of fundamentalist Protestants yeah. from the north of Ireland who have been involved in, a, were involved in a 30-year armed conflict because they hated Catholics. They didn't just hate Catholics, they killed them. Indeed, the beginning of what was called the Troubles was when a couple of blokes who happened to be Catholics got shot. by Protestants. That was all, of course, a proxy war, was essentially about class and nation and everything, but it was one in which the English, the very little, little, but enormously powerful English, presented themselves as neutral arbitrators between what were regarded as feuding, brutal paddies, all of whom adhered to mad religions. Well, here we are again in England, about to leave a part of the world that we, that's full of people who are foreigners, as you know, because a lot of you are, um, and we're propped up in this exercise by this little party of little Ulster men and women who are nothing if not fundamentalist Protestants. Northern Ireland is a little enclave in this archipelago where a woman still, the only one left, think about it, the only one left where a woman can't have 
illegal abortion. Because everybody's not only terrified of allowing it, but terrified of talking about it. Okay, so that's the country from which I hail, and the place that this city, that's hosting our conversation, as if we weren't part of the problematic of this conversation. We also, as it happens, we don't just depend upon a fundamentalist, Protestant, nasty little party, but we have an established church. We have a queen who presides over that established church, and that established church, as you all probably know, has been the subject of our second great national tribunal of inquiry into the sexual abuse of children. Because the Church of England, which is our established church, has harboured for decades, probably centuries, the institutionalised sexual abuse of children, which for the people who are the perpetrators, of course, was carried out uh, in the name of God. In the name of God. Again, this is terribly important, because we in England don't think about it very much, and we don't connect the dots, but they couldn't be more important. This National Tribunal of Inquiry has concluded that the Church of England, which is presided over by our Queen, and the archbishops sit in the House of Lords, they stand accused <coughs> of creating a conducive context. Mm -hmm. Professor Liz Kelly's great term, a conducive context for the sexual abuse of children, of course, and the routine humiliation and disparagement of women. So, I say that because I don't want us who are from England to feel that we are not in this conversation, except insofar as somebody else is our problem. So much so are they our problem that we want to quit um, any kind of economic and political alliance with our nearest neighbours, all because all of you lot are here. So that's the context in which we're having this conversation. Okay, let me begin by introducing then this great panel of women. Oh. Right, um, where's Anna? No. Where's Anna? Anna is here. Um, Anna Zabnina is Russian and doesn't want me to say very much about her, but what I will say is that she's involved in the front lines of the great tumult in Europe of migration, religion, culture, faith, pauperization, and the crisis of faith at the center of which, of course, is a crisis primarily for women and children. So that's her. You will begin, I think, our conversation. Tell us something about what the work is that you're doing and what your reflections are on this theme, the necessity of secularism as a defense of women's rights. Okay. I will try. <laughs> uh, so I work for uh, the European Network of Migrant Women. We are a platform of migrant women organizations uh, in 20 European countries. And uh, we're based in Brussels, so we're, we're registered in Brussels, but in, we work at the European level, as well as sometimes through our members at national level. So I think that I, I won't be going into the details what happens in specific countries, and I will try to give a little bit of a European and maybe even international view. Um, and I think as a last panel, it's a good opportunity to connect some issues. Um, so I, I want to bring up three things. Uh, what I think we are facing here and the importance of secularism in um, opposing what we are facing is the following. Um, it is essentially an international and very well funded male rights movement where different intersecting oppressive to women or anti-women ideologies come together who use the same or very similar strategies and tactics of which there are several but one of the central ones is instrumentalizing not only human rights and women rights discourse and achievement and struggle, but women themselves. And I'll give you 
an example. So when I say uh, movements or ideologies that come together, that intersect, I use the term intersect on purpose because I want us to think what intersectionality means because it's a very popular term nowadays. Everybody is intersectional. Um, we, I don't think, apart from the fact that nobody knows where the term comes from and what it really meant in, initially, but I think that the way we think of intersectionality is in terms of um, over, uh, intersecting oppressions. What I want us to think is intersecting oppressors as well as when those oppressors intersect with those whom they oppress. Uh, I'll give you one example of what happened in France yesterday and apologize if anybody else was <laughs> about to bring this up. Um, so yesterday, today we celebrate or, or mourn uh, the, the, the day um, for elimination of violence against women. And yesterday in France there was a march dedicated to this issue, and a lot of women were marching in, in Paris, in Marseille, in other cities. And so what happened in Paris is that uh, uh, the march was led, the face of the, of the march uh, was, was kind of led by, by three groups who effectively monopolized power in the organizing committee of the march and pushed out a lot of strong and serious uh, feminist organizations from organizing this march. And so the Women's Rights March against violence against women, against male violence against women, was led by, first of all, organization called STRAS. It's a so-called sex workers' rights organization, which is basically represented by a group of men who are into sadomasochism. Um, it's, it's not an exaggeration. There are men who are in dresses who are doing uh, sadomasochistic practices with other men. And they represent the sex worker rights movement in France. Uh, then there was an organization, a transgender rights movement, uh, who was together with them. And the third fundamental actor uh, who was leading the march was intersectional Muslim feminists. I think this is something that we need to think about very seriously. What, what does it mean when these three forces come together and lead a woman's movement, or you know, something that's supposed to represent a woman's movement? So this is one example of intersecting um, ideologies that we are uh, facing um, at the European and international level. Another example that I'm going to give is I want to, to, to quote something for you. So in 2017, in Russia, there was the first uh, Congress called Men's Rights Movement Congress, where that, that, that put, uh, um, that prepared a draft document with a lot of demands, uh, among them uh, returning the male rights and male entitlement, particularly the rights of men uh, to the children, it's for abusive fathers, specifically. Uh, a lot of it is related and supported by the Russian Orthodox Church, as was already mentioned. But the document, what, what they said in the end, so the guy who was presenting the, the draft, he said, I remind you, this was the draft for the plan of action for male rights movement that should act as a consolidating ground for our movement internationally, for all nations. It needs legal revision, after which we will be lobbying and proposing it to become actual laws. And then they continue saying that they're saying, now we are just in social media, but actually we're gonna start working seriously with power. This is not a joke. Those women who are here from Poland and from <laughs> Serbia, they would know that it is an international male rights movement, that they go uh, strategically in different Eastern European countries to, excuse me? <laughs> to train and give, give legal training specifically to lawyers uh, so that they can challenge a legal system. And one of the challenges uh, um, that they're trying to mount is against Istanbul Convention, but also against CEDO. There are various um, legal instruments that feminist women, women rights advocate created over the years that um, male rights movement is trying to dismantle. Uh, together with them, so this is a simple patriarchal male, not necessarily purely connect, connected with religion. 
However, when we look at the national level, who is supporting those movements and advocating and sitting and proposing the laws that, that, that support the arguments of these movements, they are religious organizations. And they very often have the female face. Um, and um, I think I'm going to finish for, for the moment here and maybe then we'll return to some brighter uh, aspects of our work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Chinsia is going to talk to us. She's a philosopher. She's been involved in journalism and lots of different kinds of writing, but is very importantly now involved in the formation of a manifesto that is dealing with, now I might get this wrong, um, but is a manifesto that is for secularism in the context of your argument about <coughs> multiculturalism, in the context of the great migrations um, across North and South Mediterranean. So can you tell us something about what, what your thinking is here? Yes. Good. <laughs> thank you. First of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a very a big honor for me uh, to speak here. Um, today, uh, we are witnessing a comeback of religious fundamentalisms uh, all over the world. Um, and I think that the only democratic way to contrast this offensive is a more secular society and not uh, a multicultural society. Uh, my point is that multiculturalism is not secular and um, I try to explain uh, you why, uh, what, I, what I mean with secularism and why uh, it's different from multiculturalism and why uh, multiculturalism is not secular at all. Um, in my view, secularism is the set of conditions uh, which on the one hand allow the various visions of the world to express themselves in the public space in a pluralistic society, and on the other hand, and most important, guarantee the individual rights of every human being. Uh, secularism means not invoking any authority or tradition to justify a limitation, if not a violation, of the autonomy and freedom of each human being. So what the secular state must uh, guarantee is freedom of consciousness and speech and expression of each citizen, uh, which obviously includes freedom of, religious, of religion, but also includes freedom from religion, without which freedom of religion is not freedom at all. Um, and these rights must be guaranteed to the individuals, not to the groups and actually, if necessary, against the communities or the groups uh, to which the individual belongs to. Uh, this is why secularism, is, in my view, is not the pole of a symmetry, uh, but it's a pre-political condition uh, of a coexistence that put human rights at the center, rights that cannot be violated in the name of any god. And that's why I wrote this uh, manifesto. This is a secular manifesto against uh, multiculturalism because I believe that it is necessary that activists for a secular society organize themselves and become manifest indeed. Uh, I think we need a secular militancy uh, if we don't want to leave our societies in the hands of fundamentalists uh, who are uh, militant by definition. And uh, why is this approach, this secular approach, so different from the multicultural approach? Um, let's take uh, as example the issue of migration and uh, of integration and welcoming people. Um, in a... Um, in a, a secular approach to this issue, um, we have to welcome people as people, not as representatives of categories, communities, 
and uh, cultures. Uh, it means, for example, that we cannot accept that in uh, reception centers for migrants, women are prevented from attending language courses if the lessons are held by men, or that we cannot accept the demands of fundamentalist families who want to prevent their daughters uh, from attending gymnastics or biology lessons. Uh, the multicultural approach sees people as members of groups, as representatives of cultures, and prescribes to respect these cultures. But cultures are social products, constantly challenged, not only from outside, but also and mainly from inside, that is from those who are also the carrier of the culture itself. Um, I think that the relationship of the individual with its own culture is always dialectical and contradictory. And if I have uh, one more minute, I, want, I would like to tell you a story, a story of a young girl, uh, Rita Atria. Rita Atria was the daughter of a mafia boss from a village in Sicily near Main. When she was a child, the father was killed. His place was taken by Rita's brother. Rita started to keep diaries in which she noted everything that happened in her house. Uh, when even the brother was killed, Rita decided to give her diaries to the judge, Paolo Borsellino. Borsellino immediately understood the importance of the information contained in the diaries and put uh, Rita under pro the protection of the state with a new identity, a secret home, and so on. A few months later, Paolo Borsellino was killed by the mafia. Rita could no longer stand the situation. She killed herself. She was 17 years old. Rita was renounced by her whole family, even by her mother, and even after she died. When I think about Rita, I wonder what was the relationship between Rita and her culture? Mm -hmm. What respect was Rita due to her community? Of course, Rita has disrespected her community. All those who put in discussion the established order lack respect for those who want to maintain the status quo. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Annie oh. is from the United States and is going to help us think about the conditions in which religions are authorised, legitimised, have space in a curious configuration between federal and local state, which is very important in the construction of your political culture. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. I, I'm very glad to be here today. Can everybody hear me okay? A little bit quiet. Yes, yes. yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'll talk louder. I'm very glad to be here today because it's a way to honor the memory <coughs> of my mother, Anne Gaylor, who was born today, November 25th, 1926. And she died three years ago, but she was the principal founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I was the co-founder when I was a college student and today continue with it. And uh, she was a good person for sound bites. Um, she made up sayings like, nothing fails like prayer. <laughs> said, you can speculate endlessly about the non-existent. Um, and at the Freedom from Religion Foundation, we use her motto, uh, there can be no religious liberty without the freedom to dissent. In other words, if you don't have freedom from religion in your government, you can't be free. And clearly, if you're a non-believer, you can't be free. And this workshop is perfect for me. I told Marianne this is ideal because I've spent my life working for secular government and women's rights. 
but I'm here today to say that unfortunately I kind of feel like my life's work might be totally threatened um, in the United States. Uh, the fight for uh, contraceptive rights and abortion rights is what uh, resulted in our founding the Freedom From Religion Foundation. It was my mother's early activism in the late 1960s that opened our eyes to the fact that organized religion was the sole opposition to reproductive rights. And my mother felt that we would be fighting this battle forever for women's rights unless we got to the root of the problem. She felt that it was an advantage for individuals to be free from religion, but it's an absolute necessity for government to be free from religion, that we would never be free if we have religion in government. And of course, we thought that the, we knew that abortion was always going to be a bit of a battle, but we thought the contraceptive uh, war was over in our country, and of course, it's come back with a vengeance. And I'd like to preface my remarks with just a little bit of Civics 101 in the United States. You probably know that the US Constitution was the first in the world, in history, not to invoke a deity. It's a godless constitution. I don't think most Americans know that. They kind of gasp when you tell them that. It's secular. Uh, there's no religious test for public office. Uh, the oath of office of the president does not involve putting his hand or her hand on a Bible or saying, so help me God, even though they all do that now. And of course, the First Amendment um, in the Bill of Rights said that government may not establish religion. And the other prong of that is that there is, it may not prohibit the free exercise of religion, and there is some tension between those two things. And of course, it's a highly flawed document, but we've been amending it thanks to People like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, feminist free thinkers. We got um, the women's vote in, in our constitution in 1920. We're going to have our 100th anniversary in 2020. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote that the Bible was hurled at us from every side as women fought for women's rights. And it wasn't just for the right to vote. We've been fighting for women's right to bodily autonomy for a long time in the United States, and I can quote you 19th century freethinkers. I was reminded of um, Voltairine de Clare, the name for Voltaire. Um, when I heard Ina talk, she said that she could not understand why women had not rebelled against the doom of the gods. We want our bodies now. God is deaf, and his church is our worst enemy. Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who worked with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, wrote that there has been no rebellion like that of woman versus orthodoxy, that we've seen its beginnings and its end will be a rejuvenated world. And of course, the early feminists were uh, fighting against Christianity. We're still fighting against Christianity in the United States. 1.1% uh, of our population is Muslim. And so we don't see the same issues that have come up today in some respects, but there is some intersection. Um, and uh, what has happened, we had a, the first secular nation, and now uh, we're a country that disrespects this principle. And we have seen that um, the religious right is in control of the White House, the administration, the executive branch, the Senate, Thankfully, not the House starting next year, but now the Supreme Court. And that is our real battle in the United States when you're working for secularism and women's rights. Um, we now have, we have a nine-body Supreme Court. Five of them have gone over to the dark side. We have five justices who are firmly ultra-conservative. Um, and they're all, they're all Catholic, by the way and four that will be upholding rights. And Trump has been allowed to uh, appoint an unprecedented number of federal judges. And uh, some of that is Obama's fault, and some of it is that he was very blocked when he tried to do it in his second term. And presidents come and go in our country. There can't be more than eight years of them, but the Supreme Court appointments are a lifetime. And so it enters into two generations. And so we are looking at very great endangerment of Roe versus Wade. Um, the state of Ohio is poised to 
pass a law that would make abortion illegal after six weeks. The whole point is to go up to the Supreme Court. Um, contraceptive rights are already endangered. And of course, what we do at the Freedom From Religion Foundation is very much endangered. We've been on a winning streak, but this is going to have a very chilling effect on, on the uh, court, on the lower courts. And of course, um, the social policy in our nation is uh, at, the, at the mercy of our vice president, Mike Pence, who is beyond extremist. He is a Christian nationalist, a Christian supremacist, and social policy has been virtually turned over to him by Trump, who is giving the religious right everything that they ask for. So um, you may have remember that Mike Pence said he's a Christian first, an American second, and a Republican third. So that's who we're dealing with. And um, so Trump has this opportunity to mold our federal judiciary. And, uh, but as uh, Beatrix said, we have a state federal uh, setup in the United States. Um, we have federal courts, and then each state can set up its own courts and its own laws. And, there we really are in trouble because the federal judiciary is much more liberal than the state courts. And one of the uh, women got up and asked a question earlier, um, stealing a bit of my thunder, but I wanted to talk about this decision that came down just as we were flying here from the United States um, on, on FGM. It was a decision about uh, genital mutilation. And it was a federal court decision in the state of Michigan that virtually overturned a, a national law that outlaws um, female genital mutilation. And uh, I haven't had a chance to analyze the decision yet. Um, they, they think there might be a way for, for Congress to remedy it. But basically, the court said that, that the Congress did not have the right, the national government did not have the right to tell Michigan that it had to outlaw uh, female genital mutilation. And this is a case involving a, a woman physician who said she just nicks the babies. And um, so we are seeing still in this country, some of our country, some of the same issues that you've been talking about today. But what this case is very concerning to me about is that I think it foreshadows the way that all of our other human rights and women's rights are going to go. There's going to be a big push for states' rights. And in our country, that means um, that was what the slaveholders called for. That's what the... Uh, the segregationists always call for states' rights over federal rights. And if they turn abortion over to the states, in my state, Wisconsin, they have never taken off the criminal statutes that would immediately uh, criminalize abortion and send women and doctors to, pr to prison. So we are very worried about the situation in the United States. But I think that it does point to this overarching principle which is that if you have a human right or a woman's right, it cannot be dependent on the state that you live in. If, if there's a, uh, you know, we, before we had a Supreme Court decision on marriage equality, which is surprising we got that, some states, uh, gays could marry and others they couldn't. Well, how is this possible? Uh, the, the right to wed is a human right. And so we are talking about universal rights here and that we cannot allow um, where you live to determine your, your human rights and your civil rights. So that's where we are in the United States. Thank you so much. <laughs> Betty. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Betty is uh, from Morocco, is a psychologist and a great activist for all sorts of dimensions of what we shall call sexual politics in Morocco at some very considerable cost to her own self and her own safety. Uh, can, you, can you help us think about in what conditions this movement that you're associated with has had some space in Morocco and in what conditions it's so endangered? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And sorry for my bad English. <laughs> I will do my best. So I'm Betty. I co-founded a movement in Morocco who called Mali, Alternative Movement uh, for Individual Liberties. 
So it's a um, movement of uh, civil disobedience and uh, it's a feminist, a universalist and a secular movement. So first of all, it's important to know that Morocco is um, an absolute monarchy by divine right. So it means that the king is the commander of faithful and descendant of the prophets. People say <laughs> that uh, the, the king is descendant of the prophets. So Morocco, um, in Morocco, the king has complete control over all parts of the government and uh, has all the powers. Um, Islam is a um, religion of the states. And what means um, divine rights? So divine rights means that the monarch is not subject to any rule on earth and his right uh, to, to his right to rules comes directly from God. So it's very complicated for our movement um, because uh, we are fighting all individual liberties and human rights as universal rights. So like we don't we we do not believe on um, uh, Western like human rights because a lot of people in Morocco say that our struggles and our fight is not. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's from uh, Eastern, uh, Western area, but as a universal movement, we say that it's uh, human rights and women's rights are universal. So we cannot accept uh, like uh, the concept of intersectionality or Western human rights and Eastern human rights or white feminism and other feminism. So it's very complicated because in Morocco, all organizations, human rights organizations and feminist organizations are uh, interse intersectional or other, other feminists uh, and human rights activists are like, uh, um, they try to, to tell us that they are agree with us, but, so, but what? So it's uh, uh, cultural relativism and we reject this uh, cultural relativism. So it's very, very difficult to, for us to fight in Morocco because we are very isolated because of our uh, struggles and our like ideology. Um, in 2009, I co-founded this movement and there is an article in the penal, Moroccan Penal Code so the article 222 says that a person commonly known to be Muslim who violates the fast in a public place during Ramadan without having one of the justification allowed by Islam shall be punished by one to six months in prison. So uh, for us, uh, freedom of religion and freedom of conscience is like the pillar of other liberties and other rights. Um, so in 2009, we organized a symbolic picnic during Ramadan. Um, um, it's a colonial law, by the way, <laughs> French colonial law. So yeah, we organized this picnic. We called to stop penalizing uh, people for eating during Ramadan and to repeal this article of the Moroccan uh, Penal Code. So of course, it was very, very difficult and uh, we had a lot of death tweets and uh, we, have to ha we had to hide, etc. So it was in 2009, but since this uh, happening, uh, Mali is like very famous. And since 2009, we break a lot of um, taboos and uh, like, um, uh, because a human rights organization in Morocco uh, the difference between uh, this organization and us is like they tell us that they are priorities, but we cannot understand in human rights they are not priorities. Uh, so like uh, sexual and reproductive rights, it's impossible in Morocco for this organization to, um, to organize campaigns or uh, something like this. So we organize a lot of things uh, on these um, sensitive issues. So some examples, because I cannot uh, um, uh, uh, speak about all demonstrations and uh, campaigns, but for example, um, abortion rights, they, ab abortion is forbidden in Morocco. Um, so in 2012, we, call, um, we collaborate with an NGO from Amsterdam, Women on Waves. 
So this NGO uh, from Netherlands uh, has an, an, uh, a boat. So the demonstration is the happening is with the, the abortion boat from this organization. So we invited this organization in Morocco. So it was the first time and uh, the unique time, uh, actually, uh, in a Muslim country. So um, our messages were to, were, was to legalize uh, legalization of abortion and to promote the idea of, of a safe medication uh, abortion. Now in Morocco, uh, the, um, the pregnant woman um, can abort only if uh, her life is in danger, but uh, the, the, uh, her husband um, has to like uh, yeah permit permit her. So if the doctor say that, it's, uh, that she is in danger, the doctor, she cannot, because if, if the husband uh, doesn't want uh, to her to abort. But in, actually in Morocco, there is a debate about abortion rights. So the problem <laughs> with the other organizations and feminists is it's like a false debate, a fake debate, because uh, we are a pro-choice movement, but the other organization, it's like the debate is about abortion, um, like case by case, and it's not um, it's not the the voluntary pregnancy intervention. It's a, it's a it's like scientific uh, debate. It's about medical intervention intervention of pregnancy. So it's different, but we are we are victim of censorship, of course. So we are not um, like uh, in, uh, invited in. Uh, in uh, conferences or, uh, or, um, or workshops about abortion rights because as a pro-choice movement, uh, we promote the rights of women to control their own bodies. And in Morocco, uh, people say that uh, our vision uh, is from, uh, is from uh, Western, uh, Western, fe Western feminists. Um, like in 2013, I think, um, we organized a kissing. Mm -hmm. So in Morocco, it's, <laughs> it's, it's impossible to, to kiss your boyfriend or, or your girlfriend in public. Or it's, well, it's a very conservative country, you know, and very religious uh, country. But in 2013, uh, two teenagers um, were arrested for posting a picture of themselves kissing on Facebook. So 14 years old, I think. And the um, uh, three teenagers, the two, the, the couple, and the friend who take the pictures. So we organized a kissing in Rabat in front of the parliament. It was horrible. Uh, yeah, it was a su suicide, actually. <laughs> so you can see the, 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 um, the happening uh, on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was very... But it was very interesting because it's, we have to do things like this to, 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 to break uh, the taboos and, uh, and uh, to, to change the, the mentalities. Other organizations in Morocco are very, like, very quiet and very traditional or classical. And our movement, it's alternative movement. So that's why we are um, like subversive, <laughs> and our demonstration and campaigns are as well. Um, we uh, we fight for um, sexual liberty because in Morocco uh, we cannot uh, have sexual uh, uh, have sex before marriage. So for heterosexual people, and of course homosexuality is forbidden, and it's uh, it's jail for heterosexual people and. And, um, and homosexual. So in 2012, I think, I initiated with uh, my group uh, the IDHAT, so International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, because it doesn't, uh, uh, it didn't exist in Morocco on May 17. So since since uh, 2012, we organized and we organized a lot of uh, demonstration and campaigns, a subversive one of course, uh, about this um, uh, the, the, uh, sexual, uh, sexual uh, liberty. And um, as a woman, it's very difficult because I'm the co-founder and I'm the spokeswoman of Mali. And uh, I'm like the first woman I say that I'm um, atheist. I'm the first woman I say that I have sex before marriage, etc. 
and uh, I'm, it's not important, but for my story it's important, I'm not lesbian, but for Moroccan people, <laughs> I'm of course a lesbian because I'm defending LGBT rights, and, uh, and I, as I told you, um, man and woman, we cannot uh, kiss in public, and in uh, one of our campaign, um, I kissed a, a woman in the, so it's very complicated. Mm. So yeah, it's, um, <laughs> Uh, so, what can I say? Uh, I have some problems with, um, like with, the, with society, of course, and I'm victim. So I was victim several times of harassment, uh, death threats, uh, rape threats, etc. And I have some problems with the authorities, but it's important. I do not have a lot of problems because of uh, the media power, yeah, um, yeah say media power. and the support, um, a lot of NGO supports, uh, hopefully, our movement. But uh, there is a strategy in Morocco when, for, for people like me, because the authority cannot uh, arrest me because of my activism. Uh, uh, they, they can arrest me because of other things, and because I'm a woman and because I never hide what I am and what I do uh, in 2014, for example, uh, I, because I'm a woman, I cannot drink alcohol, etc. So uh, to fight this social hypocrisy and uh, sexi sex sexism, um, in 2014, like in, at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning, I took a picture in front of the parliament with a beer in a hand and cigarette in another one. Another hand. So I have a lot of stories like this. And so for the authorities, I'm like crazy woman. I'm, uh, I'm a prostitute. Um, and so for my, when I'm, I was arrested, and I have a lot of trials again, uh, it's for public uh, drunkenness, yeah? <laughs> all the time, ah, all the time. So um, that's it. <laughs> I can really, I can <laughs> listen to you. So. <laughs> Nadia yeah. is hello. Hello. <laughs> is a filmmaker in France. Also, there's maybe something about the North and South Mediterranean that produces scandalous notorious, cheeky, drinking, <laughs> <laughs> bodies, women. Um, uh, Nadia has made a very notorious movie. All of her no movies are very notorious. Neither Allah nor Master, which you got into a great deal of trouble for. Can you tell us something about that and Tunisia? And, and I think it would be great if you can help us think about, because uh, we have in our minds... Um, the revolution mm. in Tunisia. Can you help us think about why it is that religion and misogyny rise and rise, what the difficulty is for secularism to assert itself, and your, your take on something which is different from our concept in England of secularism, which is, it's even a hard word for me to say, laïcité. laïcité. Thank you. Everybody um, knows. <laughs> yes. Okay. Off you go. Yeah. It's uh, um, first of all, uh, thank you, Mariam. It's I think the third time or fourth time I'm coming in London because of you, <laughs> <laughs> and it's always for me, you know, like giving me energy, really, because you know, feeling all these thoughts, you know. Uh, agree together and uh, for me you know solidarity it's the best way to continue the struggle so all over the world you know and I don't think I'm going to talk another time about my movie you know because <laughs> now there is seven years I made it in Tunisia because I started it before revolution and I didn't know the revolution is coming in Tunisia we call it revolution because now I'm, I'm one of the persons that I don't think anymore it was a revolution, you know. 
because for me a revolution it's change the system and I'm not sure we change the system in Tunisia but something is very important that now in Tunisia people can speak free I'm not sure it's giving results all the time you know but I can take an example of the struggle of the woman in Tunisia because I want to, for the first time, you know, <laughs> I want to give you good news from Tunisia and from, from North Africa. And I, we hope, you know, something can be an example for the, the, the world and that we have to continue the struggle ever and ever because sometimes we win, you know, and when we win, it's, you know, something, another step for the future. So in Tunisia, now we are near to accomplish the total equality between men and women in Tunisia because we are really different than Algeria and Morocco and, of course, Libya and all the other Muslim countries around, you know. And we have a lot of laws. Um, uh, for the women, you know, that uh, we have civil marriage, civil divorce, uh, we have control of birth since everything f from the 50s, you know, from the, the, the independence of Tunisia. So this gave a lot of uh, rights for the women and the, there is one thing, really the, the be you know, the, the most important things, I think, that we are going, uh, that we were struggling uh, for, for many, many years from the feminists in Tunisia, it was the equality in the inheritance. And now we are near to win this, but not because of our president, our, as I, I read you know, in the newspaper in France and uh, maybe here in England, I don't know, uh, not because our president proposed this law to the, 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 the parliament, but because of the struggle of the feminist movement. And this is really... <laughs> we have to really, you know, it's, it's also because in Tunisia, we have a lot of women in all parts of the economy and all parts in the... Uh, studies and uh, you know now in university most of uh, the students are women we uh, more than the men you know and uh, it's very important because before Mariame says that in Algeria you, a woman is always a minor you know in Tunisia it's not th the same you know we don't need the uh, the authorization of our father or husband or brother to make a passport. That's, it's in Algeria, you know, it's incredible, but it's true. And uh, this is to tell you, you know, the good news from Tunisia, because for me, it's, and last year, the parliament, because of the struggle of the women too, uh, votes a law, you know, against violence against women. You know, and it was really important because in those law, it always includes the violence in the how do you say in um, in the in in the uh, huh? in uh, uh, conjugal the violence marital oh, marital, marital. marital. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 violence Domestic you know violence. and yeah. also the rape and everything you know so now a woman can go to the police and uh, make a complaint about this, you know. It's very important. I know they will not change all the mentality in Tunisia, but I'm sure uh, because I, I saw Tunisia so different than the other countries that sometimes we don't have to wait for changing the mentality to change the law. Sometimes, you know, the law can change the mentality. You know? Okay, <laughs> this is the good news. But <laughs> what, what I have to say about laïcité? Yeah. yeah, laïcité is my, you know, my fight, you know, or, of my life. Because when I made this movie, neither Alain nor Master in English, but in French, they obliged me to the distributor in France obliged me to to change the title, and now it's laïcité, inshallah. 
And, uh, <laughs> but, now, because they said it's because the Islamists, you know, attacked the cinema in Tunisia and they broke the cinema that I changed my title, but it's not true. But it's true that they attacked the cinema and they broke the cinema, you know, and the violence against me on internet, on Facebook, was something incredible that I never imagined coming from Tunisia and make me very famous around the Arab world, you know. I was on, you know, Jazeera television, everything, you know, as uh, this atheist filmmaker, Tunisian woman, you know, because I'm not more filmmaker, I'm first of all atheist, you know, and in, in Arabic, you know, when, we, when you say that, you know, it's like an insult, uh, because you cannot say that I am an atheist, you know, and I, t I say it, on television in Tunisia, it's why uh, it was, uh, it, ma it makes me a lot of trouble because we have to remember always that the Islamists are making good politics. I mean good politics, I mean they are fighting, you know? And we have to be very aware about that, you know? They are not idiots. Mm -hmm. They are not uh, arriere, you know, from the past. They know everything, and for them, and they say, you know, that democracy, it's not the goal. Democracy, it's, a, it's an instrument, you know, to win the power, and they, they say it, you know. So we have to be always aware about that, that we have in front of us people very, very modern, mm -hmm. At the opposite that, 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 that the, the, they defend, you know, they are really modern. They use internet, they use uh, cinema, they use everything. So we have to be uh, more intelligent, you know. And as, uh, as Mariam has said before, be really um, aware about what the, the word we use with them, you know. It's why I always use Islamist, you know, not Muslim, and we have to explain to the people that it's not the same. When you are Muslim, you are a believer, and when you are Islamist, you are a person who use Islam with political goals, you know? And uh, it's really important. We have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it because we are not uh, Islamophobic as th this term they use now everywhere. It's coming from France, I think, and it's uh, it's very. Uh, uh, we, as Elizabeth Badinter say, says in in France, we don't have to be afraid to be uh, Islamophobic, you know, because we are not. I am not against uh, the Muslim people. I can be against religions, you know, <laughs> but. The people who believe, I cannot be, you know, in my family, I have a lot of cousin, grandmother, she's dead now, but you know, believers, but they never, uh, they never uh, um, um, forced me to think uh, in God, you know, because since I'm, since I'm a child, you know, I don't believe in God because my parents were communist. Some of them, you know, are very good. Communist. <laughs> I defend them. Yes. <laughs> Not all of them, but I defend some of them. You know, because I've got very, very uh, um, intelligent parents who lets me, who lets me know that when I grow up, if I want to believe, I can't believe. You know, but they said, you know, for the moment, we cannot teach you that there is something, you know, in the sky looking at you, hearing at you, and everything, you know, and it was not Stalin, too. <laughs> Can I ask all so, of you a, a, another question that, yeah. that goes to this theme about, help me with the pronunciation. Laïcité. Thank you. Um, <laughs> because we're talking about a moment, mm. a conjuncture mm. in the world, mm. where something that it was assumed would decline, religion hasn't. And it's also a moment when there's unprecedented geopolitical reconfiguration happening with 
extraordinary and dangerous effects, particularly in your country and certainly in this mm. country. So help us, can you, can you all say a little bit more about the, the importance of this concept in the context of your, for example, your thinking about multiculturalism and what we would recognise in Britain probably as a kind of soppiness about faith and authority and traditional patriarchal mm. authority. Um, you're, you're all experiencing this in very, very different contexts, but they're all very, very vital to this conjuncture, if that makes sense. First of all, laicity, if, if you, you all agree, we can say it like that in English, you know, because it's translated in, in, in Italian, in Spain, and, uh, you know, in Italian it's uh, um, la laicità, uh, huh? laicità, uh, Spain it's, uh, in Spanish is uh, laicismo. Uh, in Arabic, in Tunisia, we translate it, and uh, we, 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 we said, you know, um, help me. <laughs> Laïcité. Laïkiya. Laïkiya. It's not al almaniya uh, In Morocco, we don't al know al it's something coming like, you know, uh, knowledge and uh, something like that. And we translate it in Tunisia, and uh, we make a very good, famous... Uh, um, uh, joke of uh, word, you know, it's Tunis Leek, Tunis Leia, Tunis Leikia. Tunis is for you, Tunis is for me, but it, because it's the, the same, same word, Leek, it's for me, uh, Leek, it's for you, uh, Leia, it's for me, so Leikia, you know, so it was a good uh, slogan. And we had a lot of people, you know, after revolution. Uh, making demonstration in the streets in Tunisia, you know, asking for Laikia. And uh, this is very important. It's a principle, very simple for me. And for me, it's really like the basis of the democracy all around the world. And please, when you go back to your homes, <laughs> everybody, you know, say it and translate it, translate it in English. The principle is only to separate the religion from the state. The state uh, has nothing to do with the religion. In France, uh, everybody knows that the laïcité in France means only that the state cannot interfere with the religion things, cannot finance the religion's organization or the refection of a church or something like that, you know? Can I just say, so, yeah. <laughs> and this is the principle. And it's, I think it's very easy to apply this principle, not concept, principle, you know, to all the countries around the world. So we have to uh, um, uh, demand the laicity, international laicity, please. I'd like to, can you say a word about this, Annie? Sure. Because yeah. in a sense, that's where you start yeah. with your constitution. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, first of all, I don't want to leave you with the impression that religion is really in the upsurge in the United States because a quarter of the population today identifies as non religious, a third of millennials no. identify as nuns, N O N E S, not N U N S. Um, and 21% of what they're calling Generation Z, who are the teenagers to early 20s, 21% um, of them identify openly as atheist or agnostic. So this is unheard of. Mm. Oh. So we are seeing in the United States what we saw in, in Western Europe and, um, long ago. We are seeing much more of a liaisite of the, uh, the personal uh, liaisite. Um, it's really the religious right, the extreme Christian right, is a minority in our country, but right now they have power. And this is a lesson in why we need to keep religion out of government. So it's, um, you know, things can change very rapidly. Our problem in the, in the United States is just that they've got the courts right now. They're stacking the courts. But the population isn't going to put up with it, and young people are not going to put up with it. But it's just going to be a lot of struggle and a lot of work. 
got, um, I'm very much, uh, je l'aime, uh, j'aime la cité, les cités. We love it. Good. <laughs> One. <laughs> Friends, we have a dilemma. We have to finish this conversation in 15 minutes. Now, we have two choices, and I'm going to give you, <laughs> maybe, the power to, to have a choice. That we, there were, no doubt will be a thousand questions from you. Do you want us to carry on with this conversation, or do you want us to stop for a bit and you have some questions or some thoughts? Questions. <laughs> questions, okay. Questions? Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone on the panel. And, uh, thanks, Mar uh, Mariam, for the, for the day. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about um, our defence. I was really quite um, inspired by a uh, speaker earlier on talking about what we can do against this. And it seems to me that one of the main things that we can all perhaps choose to organise around is um, the principle, the principle of centering women in all that we do. Yeah? So whatever we're involved in, whether it's the British Secular Society, whether it's uh, education unions, whether it's, um, uh, you know, our... our, 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 our um, yeah. I think, you know, in what way do the panellists think that centering women uh, could be a focus for us all bearing in mind that there are a lot of men here as well, for us all to uh, take our struggle forward. Okay. Do you want to start with that? Yeah. As Questions a, first. The question is, can you just say it again a bit louder? Do, do it's the, about the centering, centering women. Center yeah, the, women being the centre of this the project. Center. Okay, yep. okay, yes, okay. I, um, I, I totally agree. <laughs> and uh, that's why I always say that um, feminism can only be secular or laic. Uh, I don't know if we, we win this struggle. I don't it's know if we... Same. Yeah, it's not the same, but I don't know if the English language will take some of French or Italian words. We, we try to do, to do it. Um, why I, I say that? Because the, the reason we have seen, we have heard today a lot about um, the fact that the first goal of every fundamentalism uh, in the world uh, is always the uh, women's rights and the body of uh, women. There is a sort of holy alliance uh, between the most conservative wings of the f different faiths around uh, these uh, issues. Um, all religions are structures of power and patriarchy. And um, I often heard this, hear this argument. Um, is, it is about cultural traditions and patriarchal structure. Religion has nothing to do with that. Also, many people um, make this difference between culture, tradition, and religion. But I ask myself, uh, what are religions if not part of the culture? And I think we must ask, are religions acting in a progressive sense, helping to remove uh, these patriarchal dynamics, or are they helping them? In my experience in Italy, the Catholic culture uh, has always favored the <coughs> patriarchy rather than hindering it. And uh, on this issue, I want to be, to be um, clear uh, that feminism can only be laico, uh, secular, doesn't mean that it, it is not uh, compatible with a personal faith. Uh, being secular doesn't mean being atheist, obviously. There are two different things. There are many believers who struggle together with no believers for a secular mm -hmm. society. Um, that feminism can only be secular means that it must not allow any tradition or authority to put women, women's rights in questions. It means exactly what, what um, uh, she said, women's rights first of all, women's rights at the center. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Once again, um, um, 
working? Once again, I've, my attempt, and, and, and I would like everyone to go to that direction, solution focus. And solution focus would be, we're talking about constitution as if there is a God above God. We cannot change it. If it's that so, what is law and reform? How come we manage to reform so many laws? So I'm not afraid if the uh, court is somehow, uh, Supreme Court is occupied by right wing. My worry is if we are not focusing on solutions and making sure that we can reform law, we can change constitution, and it's our right to do so according to the year 2000. 18. We can do that. It's a progressive law. So let's focus on how to improve law in order to improve our life in this earth right now. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, in Morocco, for example, the new constitution um, uh, in 2011, and uh, the, in the new constitution, there is uh, an article because in the, the, the old one, the, yeah, the, the old one or the previous one, um, they are not. So the Article 19 in the new constitution um, talk about equality between uh, women and men. So there is a lot of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and in the end of the article, but we have to respect the constants of the nation. And the first constant is Islam. So it's not, uh, it's a fake uh, article <laughs> again. So it's complicated in Morocco uh, to, to change the law because when you change the law, you know, you, there is Islam and so it's impossible. Like in Morocco this year, there is uh, a law against violence against women uh, since September 2018. But there is not marital rape because, and it's a woman, Minister of Equality is a woman but from Islamic government, um, it's her law, her project, and because uh, for, for her and for the Islamic government, marital rape is not uh, a rape, it's a, a due, yeah, it's a due. So it's complicated yeah. to change uh, uh, articles or laws or constitution because there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, I, I just want to, to be optimistic a little bit, you know? <laughs> like you said, you know, to, to find solutions, you know. I think it's important to have law, you know, and to have changed this constitution. In Tunisia, I mean, it's the same, you know, we made, finally, everybody, you know, said that in Tunisia we have a light constitution, that it's not true, because it begins with, uh, you know, in the mercy of God or something like that. We, <laughs> we start with that, you know. So it's not like at all, but at the uh, Article 6, they consecrate the, the freedom of thinking, of conscience, that's, that's very important, and really written like that in Arabic, because before it was written like freedom of uh, religion. Mm -hmm. So everybody thinks uh, that it was uh, the same, but it was not the same. Mm -hmm. Freedom of conscience, but in the same article, it's written, and it was what they accused me, you know, with my film, that uh, uh, the, the, the state, the government, is responsible of the respect of um, the religion. You know, that means, you know, you don't have the right to, to um, insult the sacred, you know, the, it mm -hmm. means, so there is no freedom of conscience, you know? It's, it's in the same article. But because it's written like this, you can have lawyers and everything, like in Tunisia, you know, making to, to fighting, to uh, make laws uh, beyond, belongs, you know, the, the, the Constitution. It's why they propose, you know, this law uh, we, for the equality inheritance because it's written in the Constitution that men and women are equal in front of the law, but it's in front of the law, not in the law, you know, that it's 
very different. But it's because this is written in the Constitution that the feminist movement can uh, make this struggle to, to finally arrive, I hope, to this victory uh, soon. <laughs> Do you want to say a quick word? Yes, that's not so quick though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just wanted to connect two points. One about centering women and the other one is I think they should work together. Um, I think that question of centering women is fundamental. It's kind of obvious for anybody who works on women's rights or human rights that unless we put women at the forefront of our thinking, our revolution is not a revolution, right? There are a lot of sayings about it and I come from Russia so I know. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, but I, I think it's also a very difficult question because the, what we mean by centering women would differ as, as we can il illustrate that a lot of women would center women by uh, protecting them from male by covering their bodies. This is how they center women. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I think that it's also a question of analysis and a question of speaking to each other. Um, and I want to bring it back to my initial point of this intersectionality, and I know Betty is going to kill me for this. <laughs> the intersectionality, intersectional <laughs> feminist. I do believe in the concept of intersectionality in a, in a, in a proper way. I think that uh, here, probably in this audience, there are a lot of people who come from different sectors. Some of them are working specifically on uh, secular rights, other women are working on women's rights. And I think it's important for us to start connecting the issues and working in coalitions exactly which is what the male rights movement is doing. I can tell you that when in Denmark, um, the mm, fe feminist lawyers who are trying to protect Istanbul Convention, mm -hmm. uh, and they work on the family cases uh, when children being taken from uh, abusive f fathers, one morning this lawyer woke up and she saw her picture in the major newspapers and on TV complete defamation that she's trying to, you know, destroy traditional values, blah, blah, blah. The next day, this whole campaign was translated in Russian, in Arabic, in French. These people work very fast and they work internationally and mm. this is what we need to be doing yeah. as well. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. With that thought, that huge thought, our conversation comes to an end. I'm sorry that you didn't get to say more, but I tell you what, we're... There is drink <laughs> out there, I gather. No, not, not yet. yet. After. After. <laughs> but there will be. And, and the conversation will no doubt resume, and you will all get a chance to talk to each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.